All right, so let's do this. This is Palm Sunday. Does anybody know the significance of Palm Sunday? I hope that you do, because this is when we commemorate the final week uh, of the Lord's earthly ministry. This is it. So this is the last, uh, Lent, the Lenten season comes to an end, and now we begin what's known as Holy Week, Passion Week, Easter Week, whatever you want to refer to it. Uh, the significance is that uh, Jesus is now uh, on his way today. Uh, he is on his way into Jerusalem. Uh, this is the, fi the final week. Things are a little bit different uh, now than they were at the beginning of his ministry and throughout uh, his ministry. The, um, the narrative for Palm Sunday or the triumphal entry is found in all four Gospels and I just want to read the references to you so if you're taking notes, um, if you're looking to read the story later, you can read it in Matthew 21 verses 1 through 17, Mark chapter 11 verses 1 through 11, Luke chapter 19 verses 29 through 40, and in John's Gospel, chapter 12, verses 12 through 19. Now you know that Matthew, Mark, and Luke are the synoptic Gospels. Uh, they were all written before John. John came more toward the end of the first century. Uh, John's Gospel has a, a little different perspective. And what I wanted to do is read this story from Matthew 21, but then I do want to read it from John as well. So I'm going to go over to Matthew 21, Glory to God. So Matthew 21, and we'll read the triumphal entry. As soon as I get to it here. So it's springtime, and you know, Jerusalem is really abuzz uh, with the preparation for the Passover feast, which is a big, big deal. Uh, you know, the death angel passed over the, uh, the Israelites. Uh, and this really is a great time of celebration and commemoration, their deliverance from Egyptian bondage. It's amazing how we get delivered from one bondage only to go into another set of circumstances. Uh, that just seems to be the case with us uh, down here on planet Earth. We get free from one thing and we get bound up with another. <laughs> it's just amazing. It's a mystery. Uh, so this is a very busy time in the city very profitable time, there's a lot of activity going on, and they had to come from everywhere to celebrate uh, this annual uh, feast. And so we're gonna just go ahead and start chapter 21, Matthew's Gospel. I'm gonna begin in verse one, and I'll read verses one through 17. And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem, <coughs> and were come to Bethpage, unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway you shall find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them, and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, you shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Sion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon an ass, and a and a colt, the foal uh, of an ass. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the ass and the colt, and put on them their clothes, and they sat him thereon. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way, others cut down branches from the trees, and strawed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David, Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. And when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus went into the temple of God, sat, uh, cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple, and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves, and said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. And when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were sore displeased. And he said unto them, Hearest thou what these say? And Jesus saith unto them, Yea. 
Have you never read, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise? And he left them and went out of the city into Bethany, and he lodged there. All right, that's Matthew's account. And now over to John chapter 12, because you'll see John has a few different things that he records here in his version, or his account rather, John chapter 12. <coughs> Glory to God, I'll give you a minute to get there. And give me a moment to take some holy water. If anybody needs any holy water. All right. John chapter 12. And I'll begin reading in verse number 12. You ready? On the next day, much people that were come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees. And... Uh, Hold on, you know what? Let me back up. Let me back up because I want to include something here. Let's just, let's just go to verse 1. I'm going to include something in here. Uh, verse 1, chapter 12, verse 1. Sorry, Chief. Chapter 12, verse 1. Then, then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, which was spaghetti and meatballs, and Martha served. But Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound. This is, this is not uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus. We're talking about a different Mary, okay? Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the, anoint, of the ointment. And verse 4, then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bare what was put therein. Then said Jesus, let her alone against the day of my burying hath she kept this. For the poor always you have with you, but me... You have not always. Much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death, because that by reason of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. On the next day, much people that were come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is, is the King of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh, sitting on an ass's colt. These things understood not his disciples at the first. But when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him and that they had done these things unto him. The people, therefore, that was with him, when he called Lazarus out of his grave and raised him from the dead, bear record. For this cause the people also met him, for that they heard that he had done this miracle. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, Perceive ye how ye prevail nothing? Behold, the world is gone after him. Okay, that's a lot there in the King Jimmy. You can see there's a little difference here with John's uh, version uh, than the others, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I like the fact that he includes Lazarus in his account and also uh, the uh, former prostitute Mary um, and, and her reaction and response to the Lord Jesus. The triumphal entry uh, and my, my Bible says uh, the entry of Christ in Jerusalem, the triumphal entry, and the cleansing of the temple uh, really is a story of contrast. In my mind, as I think about this, it's a great story of contrast because, number one, I'm thinking along the lines that, first of all, in his earthly ministry, Jesus tried to keep things under wraps, so to speak. Yes, it was important for people to personally declare who they said he was, but here in the triumphal entry, Jesus went public. He's publicly proclaiming, that's right, I'm him. 
and, and see, this is going to bring everything to a, a head, if you will. There's going to, there, this is a moment for sure and certain when there has to be a response by the religious leaders. And this is, this is Jesus. This is, the way, this is the way that Jesus does things. You have to make a decision. The issue is going to be forced. You cannot hear about the Lord Jesus. You cannot understand who He is and what He did. In this case, what He was in the process of doing. You can't come to that uh, moment and not make a decision. You have to make a decision about Him. You have to. And so you can go on through your whole life hearing about it, thinking about it, even acknowledging, yes, this is Jesus. He's the Messiah. He's the Son of God. You can go through your whole life, live your whole life, get to the end of your life, and still not make a decision. And if you don't make a decision before you draw your last breath, it is too late. Absolutely too late. This, this contrast here, you notice that the Pharisees said, look, the whole world has gone after him. Can you imagine? They're, gonna, they're conspiring, the religious leaders are conspiring to kill Lazarus and put him to death again. Let's kill him a second time. I mean, they didn't kill him the first time, but you know, once wasn't enough, I guess. We're going to have to make sure he dies twice. How come? Because he's advertisement for the Lord. Look at all these people coming. Out of curiosity, if nothing else, they want to see the guy that was raised from the dead. Boy, religion will always do that. Religion will always do that. There's always going to be this, this clash, this confrontation, or this contrast where, I mean, here, Jesus is having, clearly having success at this moment that the Pharisees didn't have because the Pharisees were all about the letter of the law all about being self-righteous and arrogant and all the things that we try to te you know, teach you to avoid. This is what the Pharisees and the religious leaders were all about. Why did Jesus have to go into the temple? Why did he have to go cleanse the temple? Because you know he went and did that. I mean, that right there, that was a confrontation. In other words, religious leaders, you should have had this handled. You should have been, you should have been running my father's house accordingly and you haven't been tending to it, so I got to go in here and take care of business. Well, forcing the religious leaders to do something about it. We either got to put a stop to this guy so that the people don't follow something false or we just have to yield and say, well, you're right. You're right. We failed. We failed. We're sorry. You know, and they, well, that's something that we don't like to do. Man does not like to say he's sorry. I was wrong. Well, that's what's getting a lot of us into trouble. Maybe, maybe we come to a church like this and we have this confrontation, we have this encounter, and, and, and just maybe you have to come to the place where you say, you know what, <laughs> I'm sorry, I think I've been wrong on this, or I could be wrong on this. Yeah, you think? You think? He had to go cleanse the temple, he had to set that thing back in order, and he even said, you know, listen, uh, when, when, they were, when the religious leaders were kind of upset about the response that, that he was getting, Jesus said, listen, if these don't cry out, the very stones will. The very stones will cry out and worship me. If they don't, the stones will. Like the stones have more sense than you people. It's just amazing how this thing works. The great contrast that I see is, you know, we've got our religious mindset. We've got the way that we think things should be done. Listen, I'm a guy. I don't know if you knew that or not. And I've always identified as a guy. Never once have I ever called that into question. And so I understand. I understand how this thing works. I understand what it's like to have pride and ego, and, and I understand some of these things. Uh, unfortunate, unfortunately, we don't always know the right way. We think we do, we have to act like we do, but there comes a point in time when you just have to throw up your hands and say, you know what? I've been wrong. I've been wrong and it took God to reveal that to me. It took God to show that to me that I've been wrong and right here and now I just publicly declare that Lord I need you and I choose you for all parts of my life. Not just the parts that are convenient. I don't have little parts tucked away for myself. I just lay it all down there for you. I just give it all to you. And this confrontation with, 
with Jesus, this event, this triumphal entry, this cleansing of the temple. I mean, if for sure and certain, he is publicly declaring that this is who I am. I am the one. You're crying, Hosanna, save us, please save. You're crying, you're crying out to the right one because I'm coming in here to save you. But the big contrast is that they didn't fully understand how he was going to save them. They thought he was going to lead a rebellious uprising against the Roman government. Save us now. We acknowledge that you are the one. You're the one. I mean, you got this guy Lazarus as proof that you're something special. You raised him from the dead. Our religious leaders never did that. In fact, notice that, ne notice that the uh, people came to get healed, too, in the temple at this time. That never happened before. Under the, uh, under the current religious regime, people weren't getting healed. They were getting held down under the thumb. And so Jesus came in and said, it's all about to change, folks. Everything's about to change. You know, and they laid out this royal red carpet for him, uh, uh, so to speak, with the palm branches and the, you know, putting the, 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 the cloaks on the ground. And, and obviously, I want to point out one, I want to point out some contrast here that I, I just felt like I wanted to do this. I'm not sure. Um, let's see. Let me, let me just show you the fulfillment here of him coming in on a donkey. Uh, let me read that to you in Zechariah. Now, that's almost at the end of the Old Testament. That's just about before you get into the New Testament. So you have um, Zechariah 9. This is a fulfillment. This is a fulfillment. This is a fulfillment of uh, him riding in on the donkey. A donkey, or however you pronounce it. I say donkey, and there's no U in there, but I said donkey. <laughs> donkey. That'll do, donkey, that'll do. Zechariah 9 9. Zechariah 9 9 says this. Zechariah. Zechariah 9 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just in having salvation, lowly, and riding upon an ass, and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. Now, wait a minute. This was written some 500 years before he did this. And he's fulfilling this one right here. I mean, here's the thing. These people knew their scripture. They understood. It's like, oh, snap, that's him. Look at it, just like the Old Testament, just like the prophet said. He fulfilled everything right down to the letter. Proof positive. I mean, this may seem, and I'm not trying to debate biblical deep stuff here. I'm just saying, can you imagine something as simple as this, coming in on a, on a donkey, coming in and, and riding this way, and all of a sudden, it, there's like, to me, I'm thinking, well, what was the significance of him saying this when Zechariah wrote it? I don't know, except that Jesus fulfilled even stuff like this. What's, what's the chance or the likelihood that he would have done that? Well, uh, I mean, you either got to be the guy, you got to be the one, or you got to be a good magician to fulfill everything that Jesus fulfilled. There's no mistake in now who Jesus is. There's no mistaking who he is. He's it. He's salvation. He's the deliverer. He's the one. Everything changes with him. But the contrast is this, the people didn't understand it. Even John said, we didn't really get it until after. We didn't really get all this stuff until after. I'm wondering how much stuff we're not going to get until after. I'm wondering how much there's going to be where we're really not going to understand it until a little bit later. And you know what? I'm okay with that. How about you? I don't have to have all the answers right now. I'm okay with that. I get up here with the knowledge knowing that I know so much less than I did when I was 17. I get up here with that knowledge and I understand that, man, sometimes I wonder what the heck I'm even saying up here. I, I am so dependent on the Holy Spirit and the anointing to help me that it's scary. But isn't that the way it's supposed to be? So I get up here and I say, Lord, I know so very little, but here's what I do know and I'm going to stick with what I know and I'm going to stay in my lane and the rest of it I'm going to entrust to you and I know that I have all of forever and forever to learn the stuff that you want me to learn. It's going to be so amazing. You're going to be like, wow, there's another facet of him I didn't know about. Wow, there's something else I never figured out before. 
It's almost like, you know, you get married to, after a certain point in time, you say, man, I've been married to this woman. How long? I still don't know her. It's still, a, it's still a, a magical time in my life where it's like, oh, here's another facet I didn't understand. You know, here's something else I didn't know about. It's like, wow, it's just always changing, isn't it? So the greatest contrast, number one, I, I look at this, I say, okay, number one, he came in undeniably, he's the one, I'm the one, I'm the Messiah, I'm the Redeemer, I'm the Deliverer, I'm coming in with salvation, and they completely didn't understand it. Because less than a week later, those same people are going to be shouting, crucify him! Now they're saying, oh, here he is! Oh my God! Oh, hallelujah! Our Savior, the one who's going to deliver us, and a week later, they're shouting, crucify him. How does that happen? I don't know, but it's still happening today. But here in Zechariah 9, so he comes, let's just, let's just say, mm, he comes the first time lowly, meek, mild, riding on a donkey. But now watch what happens the second time. Here's a contrast. This one I really get excited about. All the way in the book of Revelation, or Revolution, whichever you prefer. Revelation chapter 19. So the first time he came, he came on a donkey. He came meek and lowly and humble. He had to do what? Submit himself and become obedient to death. This is, the key. This is God we're talking about. This is the creator of the ends of the earth coming to submit himself to death? Can you figure that one out? Because I can't. I can't figure that one out. The next time he, he rides in, watch this. You there, chapter 19 of Revelation, a revolution? Let's look at verse number 11. This is Revelation 19, 11. I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword that with it he should smite the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron and he treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. What a contrast. Next time he's coming riding, guess what? <laughs> Ain't going to be no mistake in nothing. You know, and nobody's going to mistake nothing. I'll tell you, this is going to be a fearful thing for those who aren't riding with him. This is going to be a fearful thing for those who aren't riding with him. So the triumphal entry and the cleansing of the temple is a story of contrast. What Jesus came to do, what he actually came to do, and what people thought he came to do. Isn't that a lot like today? Jesus didn't come to validate your emotions. Well, you know, I have a right to be happy. You ain't got no rights. You died. You died to yourself. I thought that's what you said you did. I thought you surrendered yourself to him and you gave up those rights. That's what I thought you said you did. See, when somebody says to me, Jesus is my Lord and Savior, He's my sovereign. When people tell me things like that, see, I think, well, they probably threw their hands up in the air like I did when I was 19 and surrendered everything and said, that's it, I give you everything. I surrender my rights to me. I surrender my right to be self-led and self-ruled. I surrender that right here and now, and I submit myself to your lordship. Nothing's changed. Has anything changed? No. No. And then you have the religious leaders who want to just tell you how to do it and what to do. Everybody's got some stake in this thing, you know. 
People are leading things according to their own lusts and passions and, and their own desires and their own corrupt egos. Everybody's got an internal default set to self, set to pride, set to ego. What's going to make me look good? What's going to advance my cause? What's going to promote me? Well, you're supposed to die to all that stuff. You're supposed to give it all up. This is a good time to think about that, man. Palm Sunday, you get these palm branches, go around your house and wave them. I died to me. I declare he's king. He's Lord. I died to me. Let everybody and everything in the house know I'm dead. I'm dead. I died to me. It's the best thing you can do is kill yourself. Paul said, I die every day, right? An interesting thing, he says, you know, the stuff I want to do, I don't do. The stuff I, <laughs> I mean, this poor man that I am, who shall deliver me? I, I'm doing the stuff I don't want to do. I'm not doing the stuff I do want to do. This is Paul. What a great contrast, huh? We get to the place in life where we realize that things go better when you let him do the leading. You let him do the leading. You follow after him. Palm Sunday is an important time. It's a time to remember. It's a time to remember that Jesus came to take care of business. But what business did he come to take care of? He came to take care of God's business. We were lost. We were lost and there was nothing we could do to save ourselves. We needed to be made brand new. We needed someone to die for us. We needed someone to remove our sins. We needed somebody to come in and help us. We didn't need more religion. We didn't need more rules and regulations. We needed a savior. And it's one thing, you know, it's one thing to say, oh yes, Jesus, Jesus is the savior of the world. I believe that. But it's another thing to say he is the Lord of my life. How is it that Jesus could be savior alone and not the Lord of your life? Well, we do it all the time, don't we? And, and I know this is not an easy message and I know it's got you thinking, you know, some of you are thinking, man, I thought, I thought he was going to lift us up and make us feel better so we can go out here and conquer the week. Well, I am helping you to feel better and conquer the week. I'm helping you. And it has to happen through you surrendering everything. See, that's the problem is that we're living in a time unlike any other time that I've known where men are lovers of themselves, promoters of themselves, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. The deception that we are living under is out of control, but we do not have any excuses because we are here to occupy until he comes. That's your job. Advance the kingdom, preach the gospel, occupy, don't give in, just draw a little circle around yourself and say, listen, I'm not going to let the things that are going on affect me. Who would have ever thought that we would come to this point in time where we'd have this thing going on with Disney? Um, I, I still don't know all the details, but it's shocking. It's like, man, you just wrecking childhood memories. Just totally wrecking everything here. Well, draw a little circle around yourself and say, yep, Jesus said this was going to happen. He came in on Palm Sunday. He came into the city and he said, yep, I'm the one. I'm the one. I'm here to take care of business. I'm going to change everything. I'm going to make it all better. But it's not going to be like you think. You want me to lead a revolt against the Roman government. That's not how I do things. We're going to lead a revolt against your corrupt heart. That's what we're going to do. That's the first place you got to start. You got to be made brand new on the inside. You need and experience what we call being born again. That's the experience that every man and woman need. We need to be born from above. We need to put to death the old person that is connected to sin, connected to failure. We need to put that person to death and we need to be made brand new. And then once you are made brand new, now you have to put on that new man or new woman and begin to live like it, begin to act like it, begin to think like it, begin to talk like it. Those are the things that you have to still do. We're not exempt from that. I don't care what time in history we find ourselves, you still must be born again. You still must be made brand new. And you still have to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. I can't have anybody else work out my salvation for me. I can't ride on anybody else's coattails. Once I understand the truth, I am responsible to walk in it. So the contrasts really are undeniable 
I mean, Jesus came in. There's no mincing words. There's no mistake in what he, he is declaring war on the past. We're done with this. Going to usher in a brand new day. But what does that mean? Well, it means that you're free to be happy, to really be happy. Let's just put you in touch with your true self. What the heck does that even mean? I'm going to go find myself. Well, good. Let me know goody goody gumdrops when you do find yourself. Tell me how he's doing or she's doing. You can find yourself in the word. You find yourself in Christ. That's the problem today is that Christians don't know how to find themselves in Christ. Jesus did it all. He paid it all. He lived a, he lived a life that he showed us how to do this thing. Listen, I, he emptied himself of divine rights and privileges. He made himself obedient to death. And he lived his, his, his physical life was lived without divine rights and privileges. So I know I could be successful now. He emptied himself. He said, I'm going to, say, I'm going to show you how to do it. He said, Gary, I'm going to show you how to do it. Just watch me. Oh, okay. Oh, that's how you do it? Yeah, that's how you do it. That's how you do it too. So Jesus is coming back and he's not coming back on a donkey. He's not coming back lowly and meek and mild. He doesn't have to surrender himself to death anymore. He doesn't need anybody to lay their cloaks on the back of a donkey or spread palm branches out. We're going to be coming with him when he comes back on that white stallion or that white steed or whatever you want to call this, this horse that he's coming back on. Evidently there's horses in heaven. And there must be donkeys in heaven, too. Zebras and everything else. I don't know. I guess we'll find out when we get there. But you have to understand that we're, the time that we're living in now requires that we continue to remind everybody what's at stake. We have to, we have to remind people what's at stake and, and, and what's about to happen. And I've got to go there. So while we're at the end here, uh, my clock, no clock. <laughs> I got to, yeah, there we go. Okay, plenty of time. Well, Glory to God. So I just read to you, next time he comes, what it's going to be like, okay? But now, let me, uh, let me read this to you in chapter 20. We're just going to go ahead and do this because we're going to remind you of this because you have a responsibility and a job to keep your head focused. You have a responsibility and a job to stay focused on the truth. You have a responsibility and a job to be able to share with everybody the truth. That's your responsibility. Don't sugarcoat it. Don't compromise it. Don't play patty cakes with people. Sin is still sin, and it is still wrong, and you need to say that it is. But the sin problem has been handled. How? By our, by, by our little religious programs? No, by the Lord Jesus Christ. But we don't have a license to continue in these things. But look at chapter 20 now in the book of Revolution. Revelation chapter 20, I saw an angel, verse 1. Chapter 20, I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. I like that, don't you? Cast him into the bottomless pit, shut him up, set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more. Well, that ought to tell you who's deceiving people. Satan. Uh, until the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. Uh, then let's go ahead and uh, verse, let's just keep, keep reading. I saw thrones in verse 4. They, sat, they that sat upon them, judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God. Wait a minute. There's some people that have to be beheaded for their witness and for the word, which, watch this, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Now hold on, wait a minute. What did this verse just say? People are still going to get saved during the tribulation, but it ain't going to be like it is right now. See, now it's comfortable. We create this wonderful environment. We, we create this atmosphere where people can come and they could just come as I am. Just come as you are. Just come and bend the knee willingly now before you're forced to do it later. But just come and receive the Lord Jesus and we'll all make it so happy. We'll celebrate with you. We'll bake you a cake. We'll do all kinds of wonderful things. We'll clap and we'll cheer. We'll hug you. We'll cry. We'll dance about the fire. Oh, a sinner has come home. Come home. 
I mean, the whole bit, the whole rigmarole we got going. But in that time, during that tribulation time, guess what's going to happen? You're going to lose your head. Let's read it again. I saw thrones, verse 4. I saw thrones and they sat upon them and judgment was given unto them. I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast nor his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. So wait a minute. There's going to be a point in time when you're going to be forced to worship the beast and you're going to be forced to get that mark upon your forehead and in your hand? Yeah, that's that 666 business. You don't have to worry about that right now. Isn't that, good? Isn't that nice? Isn't that, isn't that nice of God to make it easy for you? But for those later on that are left behind, see, when we go in the rapture, when that trumpet sounds and the dead in Christ are raised and then we who are alive and remain, we're going to get caught up together and be with them forever in the air. When, when we go, it's, it's going to be very bad down here. I'm just trying to be really kind about it right now. Say, so, yeah, it's going to get a little bit more challenging. It's going to be very bad. And there's going to come a point in time within that seven years where it's going to transition over into really bad. And you don't want to be here for that. I don't want to be here for that. So that's why I'm making doubly sure that you and me are okay, right, God? I mean, we're good, right? I I'm okay. So when that trump sounds, I'm going, right? Because I don't want to mess around. I don't want to be here during that time. Because things are going to be a little different. There's going to be a shift. There's going to be a change. And you're not going to be able to just come in here and do this. You're not going to be able to just treat this thing lightly and with contempt. You're not going to be able to do this. You're going to be in a position where you're going to have to worship the beast. And see, if you receive the Lord Jesus and all of a sudden you come to your senses and you say, oh my God, this is what my family was telling me. This is what my friends were telling me. This is what that wild preacher in Byron had been saying all along. And now he ain't here. I can't go talk to him because he gone. It was an alien abduction. It must have been an alien abduction because I don't know how else to explain how all these people just suddenly disappeared. I can't talk to anybody. I wish I had somebody to talk to. What's going to happen during that time? All of a sudden, you're going you're to be like, uh-oh, I guess I'm left behind. Yeah, and everything's going to flip-flop. At what point does it flip-flop? I don't know. I won't be here but it's going to get really bad. And see, this is, what, this is what he's seeing. This is what he's saying in verse 5. The rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall, go, and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, which the beast, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead small and great stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Uh, how do you do this one? How do you, how do you, here's the thing. It's just better for you to act like this ain't real. It's just better for you to act like, well, this, this applies, but I got, I'm busy. I'm busy paying bills. Nah, I'm busy living my life. I'm busy doing me. 
I got to do me, you do you. We live in a good life now, baby. See, that's been the problem. We've had it too good for so long that we act like this isn't here. And what we've done is we've turned church into this big commercial enterprise. We've, we've turned it into this big, this big business of show business and entertainment. We've turned it into something that it was never meant to be. And just like 2,000 years ago, Jesus had to go cleanse the temple. It needs to happen again. We need to have a cleansing again. And I don't know when or what or how. I'm not sure how that's all going to work. But enough is enough with all this nonsense. Well, it's a different time we're living in. We have to use different means and methods to reach a different group. Really? The problems are still the same. Man's problem is still the same problem. We still need a savior. We still need to submit to his lordship. Satan is still deceiving people. There are still people who think that it's okay to play tiddlywinks and, and not make a decision. There are those who think it's okay to put it off until the last possible moment. But how do you know when your last possible moment will be? And how do you know if you'll have any strength or faculties about you to make a conscious decision? I've seen a lot of people die in my time as, as a minister and chaplain. I've watched a lot of death. I've seen a lot of horrible things. I've seen more, th I saw things that I never thought were possible. No way that Bible college could have prepared me for the things that I've seen. I've watched what happens at the end and there are times when people don't get a choice. Boom! Over. You didn't see it coming. Well, I sure hope they repented. Not likely. They never saw it coming. Well, who are you to judge? I ain't judging. I'm just telling you the way life is. You think it's okay to put it off and wait. It's not. Now is the time. This is the moment. That's the attitude that we need to have with everyone is that, guys, don't play around with this. You know, we joke and we laugh about things like death. We joke and we laugh about, well, you know, if I end up in hell, just <laughs> at least I'll be there with my friends. Hmm, how stupid. I'll just say it like it is. How stupid. And if that insults you, I'll say, how foolish. That sounds better, doesn't it? How foolish. Stupid kind of rubs us the wrong way, so I won't say stupid too much in church, but it is stupid to act that way. And you have to understand, although you can't force anybody to make choices and decisions, your presence alone should bring them to a... Uh, uh, yeah, it should force the issue. There's something about you convicts me of my sins. I don't know what it is. You haven't said a word, but just standing here in your presence makes me want to get right with God or run away from you. Which is it? Because there's no middle ground. But that's, that's our job. Our job is to be that liaison, if you will. We're, we're supposed to do that. What? What are we supposed to do? Validate people's emotions and feelings? Uh-uh. What's, what's wrong is wrong. And what's right is right. That's never going to change. If anything, let your presence be a fork in the road. You've got to go one way or the other. No more are you going to be able to just pick it, you know, walk the fence, as they say. Praise the Lord. That's what Jesus did when he came into Jerusalem. You have to make a decision. You have to choose sides right now. And the religious leaders, so what did the religious leaders want to do? They wanted to do away with him, and they wanted to do away with Lazarus, because Lazarus was bad for the religious business of the day. And who does he think he is coming into the temple, coming into the church, and telling us, we ain't doing it this way no more, flipping things over, running people out, I only wish that that would happen today in some of these places. I only wish that would take place today. But it's not my job. It's not my assignment. And that's not what Jesus came to do. He's going to take care of business, but he's going to, he, we're going to overthrow the government. I'd love to go in and overthrow some of these churches. I'd love to, but that's not the way God does things. He goes after the heart. Because if you get the heart of a man, then you can change everything else. It may take a little bit of time, but you get a man's heart, then you can get his behavior and his action. You, know, you just can't go in and, and you know, orchestrate an overthrow. We're going to overthrow some of these churches. Now it doesn't work that way. Well, we're going to overthrow the government. Well, it doesn't even work that way either. It may have to come to that, though. Just kidding. <laughs> you just make sure your heart is right. 
I wanted to give you some perspective this morning so that you know what's at stake. Listen, it's a wonderful time. It's a time of celebration. What a happy time Jerusalem must have been. At, you know, it must have been so thrilling and so happy. You know, we're, you know, I mean, obviously things were a lot different back then, but not really. Of course, now, you know, the next thing we're setting our sights on is what? Good Friday. And we wanted to show the passion of the Christ again because I know that is an offensive movie. The last time we showed that, um, I did get some complaints and some people, and, and I thought, well, it's just too bad, so sad. This is what it's all about. I mean, you have, you have to come to a, a decision. You have to understand, listen, Christianity may not be like what I thought it was. It's not what you thought it was. It's not at all what you thought that it was. But it does change everything. Christianity is not just one of the, it's just one of the options. No, it's not. Who told you that? The world system did. Christianity is just one of the ways. It's, it's the, Jesus is the only way. He's not one of the ways. He's not a religious option. He's not a faith-based initiative. And we'll talk more about this on, on Easter Sunday. But what's happening right now, as he's coming into Jerusalem, this is about to change everything. And nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. He's still the center and the circumference of everything. What do you do with it? Well, you either, have to, you either have to embrace him and surrender to him, or you put yourself over and against him, in which case you're going to be on the other side of that white horse when he comes. You're going to be on the wrong side. You're going to be on the wrong end of that white horse. You see what I'm saying? So better now to get it right. And you've got to let your family and your friends know, listen, I'm not, here to, I'm not here to make you feel worse in life. I'm just here to let you know that we're running out of time. And I'm going to be going on that first load. And if you get left behind, you can still give your heart to Jesus, and I pray that you will, but it ain't going to be easy. It's not going to be pleasant. And, and there's not going to be a second rapture, a second load, and then a third load, and then a fourth load. This is a one-shot deal. That trumpet sounds, the dead in Christ arise. We, listen, wherever, wherever the dead in Christ are, wherever their bodies are, whatever form or condition they're in, God, Jesus is claiming those bodies and taking them back. I'm getting your body back, and I'm hooking it back up with your soul and spirit, but it's going to be a, a new body. And then those of us who are alive and remain, we get caught up to be with them. And he's not going to have another pickup. Well, if you miss this rapture, come back in three weeks and there'll be another rapture. And then, then four weeks later, so this is it. And so what should that make you feel like? Miserable and junky inside right now? No, hopefully it'll stir you up to say, you know, maybe I ought to start praying, praying for my heathen friends and family. Because <laughs> they're going to be in for a rude surprise. Maybe I ought to start, maybe I should really start praying for them, you think? How about you get a little list? How about you get yourself a little list and you start praying and say, you know, I'm not so sure about Uncle Bubba over here. I'm not so sure about Fernando down the road. I'm not so sure about some of these. I'm going to start praying for them, Lord. I'm just going to pray and thank you because you want them in heaven with us. He's not trying to keep people out of heaven, but you got to do it his way, not your way. Maybe I should start praying a little bit more, you think? And maybe, maybe when I approach the disciplines of, of my faith, maybe I should come wholeheartedly and take this, like when I'm reading my Bible, shut out everything. Don't try to read your Bible in the middle of all the distractions and try to squeeze it in so you can check that box and say, well, I did it. I don't know a thing that I read, but I did it. I can check that box off. Shut out everything. And focus on the Word of God. Spend some time with Him. Let Him talk to your heart and tell you what to do and what not to do, where to go, what not. I mean, listen, He's got a plan. He's got a plan for us. He's got a plan for your loved ones. He's got a plan for your family. And He knows the right way and the wrong way to go about doing this. Some people, you can win them over through saying nothing. Just let them see your, your consistent lifestyle. And, and eventually they'll look and they'll say, you know, you haven't said a whole lot. You've never preached to me. You've never tried to judge me or criticize me. But I've been watching you for the last 22 years. And you are, 
you are quite an example. And it just moves me to want what you have. I want what you have. It must be real. Because I've watched people go up and go down, rise and fall, stop and turn around, spin, pick a bale of cotton, and you've just been consistent. Maybe that's how you're going to win some of these people. Other people, you're going to have to take them and shake them and smack them up, uh, uh, upside the head a little bit. How many times am I going to have to talk to you about this? Turn or burn! <laughs> but you and the Lord work that out. So let me pray for you. Everybody good? Father, we just want to thank you for our opportunity to be together. Lord, whatever it is that has happened here today, I thank you that you take it and you work all things together for our good. You turn it for good. Take our feeble efforts, take my feeble words and my feeble efforts and use it for your glory. Even now, right now, Father God, the ones that are coming across our minds and on our hearts, Father, the, the people that we love and care about, friends and co-workers, family, Father God, every single one of them is going to stand before you and we do not want to fail in our assignment and our mission. So I thank you that we are fully equipped for the task at hand, Lord. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you help us. You show us our role, how we can help and what we can do. Father, I thank you. We can't do it all. Not one of us can do all of it, but all of us together can do it. And so, Lord, I thank you that we are a part of your family. We are a part of the body. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray amen and amen.